there's definitely this connection between our diet and our lifestyle and our, our, our can people getting cancer. But what about genetics and all of this? Do you think somebody could eat a healthy diet, live a healthy lifestyle, according to even what you believe is healthy, and still get uh, cancer? Well, it's hard for me to answer that with a direct yes or no. Let me be a little more vague if I can, because let's use salt as an example. Your risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke is related to your total salt intake throughout life, right? And that means if you had, like if we take cigarettes, your risk of having lung cancer is related to your total cigarette intake through life. So if you had two packs a day for 30 years, that's pack years, 30 years times two packs is 60 pack year. That gives you a 60 pack year risk of lung cancer, right? Now, if you had three packs a day for 30 years, that's a 90 pack year history. Or if you had one pack a day for 10 years, it's a 10 pack year history. So it's your lifetime exposure to cigarettes that exposes you to risk of lung cancer. Same thing with salt and hemorrhagic stroke. How much salt you ate through the first 20 years of your life, 30 years of your life is an impact on your risk of cancer down the road. And if you cut out the salt at age 80, you're still gonna be at risk for those, for all the 5,000, 4,000 milligrams of salt you ate for those 50 years of your life before you cut it out. It takes 20 years of being off cigarettes to get your risk of lung cancers to start to drop to a, to, to a rate that's only a little worse than people who've never smoked, you know, to like 1% from 30% or something. So the point I'm making is that, you know, I wrote a book on this called Disease Proof Your Child. And what that showed was that, or what that discussed was all the research showing that when cells are growing and replicating, their DNA unravels and there's more chance for damaged DNA that could cumulatively cause more defects that could promote cancer later in life. And that cancer, breast cancer, for example, is linked to the age of puberty, the first menstrual period by a woman. And let's say if that first menstrual period is 10 years old, that increases her lifetime risk of breast cancer. That means what she ate when she was two and three and four and five and six years old was a major factor when she gets breast cancer at age 60 or 70 years old. In other words, um, we're biological systems. And so the fact that somebody might have lost weight or improved their diet when they were 65, there's still not gonna be a zero risk because they could have eaten, been over obese or overweight, eating junk food, processed foods, fried foods when they were younger for many decades of their life, you know? And sure, the reason I'm so aggressive in recommending people eat such a perfect diet is because just moderate changes to and moderate dietary improvement is not enough to sufficiently reverse all the cumulative defects that occurred from the unhealthy diet you ate when you were younger. We really have to get people to maximize the ability of the cell to repair broken DNA crosslinks and methylation defects and, re and to repair the cell so it doesn't perhaps move on to a cancerous change. So the, the quest, so, so, you know, and, and these foods that, that I'm recommending with powerful anti-cancer um, effects are effective to prevent cancer and are effective at the body recognizing abnormal cells, even cancerous cells, and removing them before they can kill you or form a mass or metastasize. So the body has a lot of protection against cancer. And I have many, many examples of people with early stage cancers and even late stage cancers that were able to not have not die of cancer and live for 10, 15, 20 years without cancer recurrence through nutritional excellence. But it's not 100% because you're saying to me, is it is it mostly genetic from what we inherit from our parents? Absolutely not. That plays a relatively unimportant role or insignificant role. And scientists call that gene silencing, that these abnormal genes, even the BRCA1 or GSTP1 gene, are not a major cause of cancer in people who eat an ideal diet. They're only a major cause of cancer in people who eat a poor diet. So it's a little bit complicated. And there's also some luck involved because sometimes you shoot a bullet at the woods and it's not gonna hit a tree, it's gonna go right through the, the woods and not hit anything. But the more trees you put up, the more chance that bullet's gonna hit something. So there's a chance of hitting the DNA with something toxic and causing some a major damage, but there's some, there's some small amount of genetics involved and some small amount of luck involved. But that's such a minor, minor thing. And I'm saying that 
out of a thousand cases of cancer, my guesstimate would be that it wouldn't be one in a thousand cases. You would see, you would see, um, you know, nine, you know, nine hundred and ninety-nine of cancers never appearing out of a thousand if people lived a healthy life. But the question is, living a healthy life means living a healthy life from a young age, not living a healthy life and switching a healthy diet when you're 70 or 80 years old. And the younger in life you start, the more protection you get. So um, AJ didn't, um, wasn't just diagnosed with breast with lung cancer. She just announced it publicly at this point. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you know, it, it's she has lived relatively healthfully, but we don't know how she's been living or how healthy she's been living. And then we're not, and we don't know how healthy she lived when she was younger either. So there's no, no, um, what's the word judgment or no, no, we oh. don't have no knowledge about what her personal risk would have been, what her exposure, you know, what her history is of her parents had, if there was smoking in the home with siblings or parents that smoked or, or we don't know how much her diet played a role when she was younger or whether she was, you know, how many years she was overweight or ate, you know, pastries. I have no idea, you know, so, oh. so, so we can't comment on that. We can comment on say, and say that we have this, that nutritional science has made such incredible advances in the last decade. We can offer people the opportunity not have cancer happen to them or bring their risk of cancer down to an infinitesimally small percent if they make these changes that are sufficiently adequate. And the sufficiently adequate changes I'm talking about are not, have not been made by most other people on plant-based diets. They're eating diets of mostly potato and rice and, and macrobiotics. And they're eating you know, starch-centered diets where they're not consuming sufficient green vegetables, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, and all the anti-cancer foods we're talking about here. So they're not... Um, um, using utilizing these principles that a nutritarian diet is founded on, which 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 um, identifies those foods designed for humans with the most powerful immune supporting and anti cancer benefits. Because my experience over my forty years of medical practice has been even when I see people with cancer, like men with prostate cancer, we put them on this program, their PSAs goes down, and their cancer goes away. I've had people, I've had several patients with. Um, with stage four lymphomas, non-Hodgkin lymphoma that melted away with no treatment, just disappear. I've had many patients, I've had several patients with metastatic ovarian cancer with very poor prognosis that are still alive now, 15, 20, one woman's alive 27 years later. I have many patients with, I shouldn't say many, but I have several patients with metastatic breast cancer <clears throat> who now, you know, alive 10, 15, 20 years later, who never had recurrences, because I'll, I'll explain why this works. So the, the answer to your basic question is, is this absolute? Does that mean a person can eat healthy and never have a heart attack or never have a stroke or never have get cancer? And the answer is no, there's always these rare exceptions. There's always going to be some very rare exceptions. But is it, um, but is, are the odds overwhelmingly in your favor that the cha these changes are worth it and going to offer you protection? And the answer is yes, those odds are overwhelming you in your favor and it wouldn't be, and 99 out of 100 people are going to get the type of protection they, that we're, we're um, advocating and saying this, what we observe. There's always going to be a rare outlier. And for some of those reasons, you can't, sometimes you can't even figure out why, what their exposure was to some chemical or some, my father, you know, died of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But during World War II, he was near he was near bomb explosions and chemicals, and he had keratoconus that burnt his eyes with the bombs, and he was had to, he was smelling all these fumes from sulfur. So we we never know what the you know what what something could have been that triggered that. You know what I mean?